So, welcome everybody. It's my great pleasure to have Julian uh, Scheuer here um, from, well, several universities, uh, now currently Columbia, before University of Freiburg, and soon to be, or technically now, University of Cardiff. And he will talk about concavity of solutions to elliptic equations on the sphere. Please. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Armin. Thank you, uh, Philip and Simon and Gufang for letting me speak here in this online seminar. Um, it's a great pleasure to talk about mass again um, after being stuck in a, in a room for about three months. Um, so I will talk about joint work with Matt Langford, who is at the University of Tennessee in the US as well. Um, and we speak about uh, elliptic equations, more or less. So um, the motivation for us to study these problems come from curvature flows. So let me give you a short um, introduction to, to our motivation, why we study these things. So we, we consider a family of closed hypersurfaces parametrized over a time interval um, in a Riemannian manifold. And these hypersurfaces uh, are moving uh, along their normal direction. So, and uh, the speed of this movement is going by a fun is um, defined by a function of the principal curvatures of the hypersurface at every point. So, um, we will see several examples in a second. So, the, the the most prominent example, of course, is when you look at the mean curvature flow, where our flow speed is just the trace of the second fundamental form, or the sum of the principal curvatures. So uh, this, is, this is like the model case. Then there are nonlinear versions as well. For example, when you look at the Gauss curvature, you take the determinant of the second fundamental form and plug this in your, into your evolution equation here. And there are very many other versions of this uh, kind of uh, flows. And um, there are some classical results about these, uh, these evolution equations. So probably the most famous one is, is like the first uh, result by, by Gerhard Hüsken in the 80s. Um, it says the following. So if you have um, three-dimensional Euclidean space and you have uh, uh, at, uh, at least three-dimensional Euclidean space and the hypersurface flow um, moving by mean curvature, then this flow, and you have a strict convexity, uh, convexity condition, meaning that all the principal curvatures are positive, um, then this flow converges to a point in finite time and if you zoom into that point by by using this kind of rescaling here so now we put like the point into the origin and then we blow up the embedding vector <clears throat> by by this time by the remaining time basically then this rescaled hypersurface will will converge to a round sphere in a smooth topology so perfect control and all derivatives um, so this this convergence is with respect to t as going to capital t um, right. Yeah, I will see. Um, I, I will give you a video, like in, in on the next slide, uh, where you can see what happens there in the curve case. So this is um, for the mean curvature flow. Oh, wait, here we are already. So let me let me share um, a different um, uh, screen. So I hope you can all see that. If not, stop me right now, please. Uh, so here we have a, a curve. Uh, closed but not convex, pretty bad. It's just embedded um, in the plane. And uh, we're looking at the mean curvature flow for this case, which is classically called the curve shortening flow because it's just the one dimensional uh, surface case, right? So, um, and when, 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 I, when I start that, you can see what happens. So that the flow basically homogenizes all kinds of uh, bumps and inhomogeneities in the curvature. Um, at some point, it will come become a convex thing, and um, once it is convex, it will just nicely shrink down to a point. Um, and well, the rescaling is not depicted here, but you can see it got, becomes round. So if you scale it up, then then you will see a sphere. Uh, so this this video is courtesy to Sigurd Anjanand, who is uh, like a pioneer in these curve shortening flow questions. And um, let's look at this a little bit more more in detail. Uh, well, what is supposed to happen here. Look at, for example, this, this um, high curvature region here. So at this tip, we have a very big uh, curvature. Um, and these sides here are pretty flat, so they are not expected to move at all. But this high curvature point is supposed to move straight in here. So and you, can, you can really see that 
um, it is really shooting in fast, these high curvature regions. And as that levels out, it becomes um, more and more homogeneous. So that's what, what the curve shortening flow is doing. And if you start with a, with a convex hypersurface in Rn, basically the same thing is happening in higher dimensions. Um, however, there is a drawback when you, um, uh, when you go to higher dimensions, uh, which I will come, come uh, to in about a minute. So um, anyway, so similar results hold for the other kind of flow speeds, which I've discussed. So the Gauss curvature flow was a little bit more difficult. So for the, for the surface case, Ben Andrews has basically obtained the same result as Huskin for, for the Gauss curvature flow, but it was open for quite a while until like, well, I mean, five years ago or so, um, that when you, when you look at, at higher dimensional um, hypersurfaces. And there was Troy and Daskalopoulos who proved the same, same result for the for Gauss curvature flow in any dimension. And um, there are many, many other results like this. If you have an arbitrary curvature function f, which satisfies some natural assumptions, then you will get similar results um, as Huskin did. And there are many people who have worked on this, most, most importantly, Ben Andrews, Ben Chow, uh, Kaizen Tso, Klaus Gerhard, they have all done curvature flow um, related questions like in the early 90s and, and late 80s. Okay, so these are some model results. Um, and as we have already seen in this video, it is very important to control the maximum over the minimum um, of the curvature because you, it needs to level out, right? Because the sphere has, has a, perfectly around, a perfectly constant curvature. So we expect the flow to, to, um, to get a bound on the oscillation of the curvature. And um, what goes wrong in higher dimensions for the mean curvature flow, for example, if you have, have non-convexity, is easily seen in this picture. So you have this dumbbell kind of object with two large spherical, um, left and right ends and a thin neck in the middle. And um, the, the point is that in higher dimensions, this thing here in the middle, this, this neck has very positive and very large curvature. There is a flat side, but there is also a curved side, which has a big curvature. So what you expect the flow to do is to pinch this thing off. It will really, this neck will shrink to, to a line very quickly and this happens so fast that these dumbbells cannot keep up. So what will actually happen is the flow will tear this dumbbell apart. If you look at like a mean, like a, like a weak version of the mean curvature flow, you can actually see this. Um, you need, I mean, classical solutions won't work because you have curvature blow up, right? But um, there are weak versions where you can really see this pinching, um, that, that these things separate and become two different uh, disconnected parts. Right, and what you have here is that the maximum of the curvature divided by the minimum of the curvature approaches infinity. So this will violate um, what, what we intuitively hope for. And so it is very important um, to have an oscillation estimate on the curvature, and this is very related to Harnack inequalities. Right, if you, if you recall what like the classical Harnack inequality is for a positive solution of say, Laplace equation, it, it bounds the maximum of the solution by the minimum of the solution. And this is precisely something we would like to have in such curvature flows. And um, this is an area which has been started um, like also in the 90s by, by Richard Hamilton and Ben Andrews and others. They have proven Harnack inequalities for curvature flows. It comes in, it comes in a very um, weird looking form at first, but I will explain in a second why this is really a Harnack inequality. So it says that if you have a convex mean curvature flow in Rn, um, then you have the following pointwise uh, differential inequality for the mean curvature. So you have a, the, the time derivative uh, minus some, some term here, where I can give you a notation, um, plus like a first order term is greater or equal than zero. And this middle term here is, um, the inverse of the second fundamental form, which exists due to the convexity applied to the gradient of the curvature. So this is a positive term, right? So this is actually a good term when, with respect to this whole inequality, right? So what this gives you 
is a lower bound of the time derivative of h by h over t, right? Uh, you can just ignore this term if you like, because this is really just a good term in this inequality. So, so this gives like point-wise growth behavior of the mean curvature at any point in space, right? And, and from, from this, you can easily deduce a classical Harnack inequality by taking integrals over space-time paths. Right? You can really deduce that the minimum um, of the mean curvature at a later time bounds the maximum of the, cur of the curvature at an earlier time. Um, so this is, can really be transformed in a classical Harnack inequality for a parabolic equation. So this is quite nice. And once you have that, you can, you can really build a program and prove that the mean curvature flow converges like to a point. Yeah, or from there, you can really, this is a starter to, uh, to prove stuff about the mean curvature flow. So it's, it's a very interesting um, inequality. Um, and let me give you some, some extensions of this result, like at about the same time, uh, well, it says 1991, it's three years earlier, but I mean, I think they probably worked at the same, more or less at the same time. And this is publication date, right? So that can, can take years, depending on what genre you submit. I mean, this is JDG, and we know how long they take to publish a paper, right? So um, pro probably the same time. Um, so here we have the, 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 the Gauss curvature, uh, similar result done by Ben Chow. Uh, ben Andrews has done an uh, even larger class of, of functions f, and all, all got the same kind of Harnack inequalities. The only difference is that you have to replace the mean curvature by the F curvature. So this is, if you look at, that, at a different speed, you will need a different curvature function here in this formula. So, um, right. So we have these two results in Rn on the sphere. So outside of the Euclidean space, um, I did something together with Paul Bryan and Norma Divaki. So where you, when you have like, for example, mean curvature flow on the unit sphere. Uh, we have similar results. And um, in more general spaces, oops, sorry, we have something for the mean curvature flow. For example, when the space is locally symmetric, Einstein with non-negative sectional curvature. This is uh, the same group of people for the mean curvature flow. Okay, this is like an overview over the Harnack inequalities. And what I want to talk about now is, um, a, beautiful approach to these to prove these kind of Harnack inequalities, um, which was discovered by Theodora Bruni and Matt Langford. So they they had made the very nice observation that the Harnack inequality is related to concavity of elliptic equations. And I will show you now how that works. So we look at for simplicity only at mean curvature flow and then we can describe the mean curvature flow by the arrival time function, which is basically the level set uh, function, right? So every hypersurface of the flow is given as a level set of a function W. So it's characterized by this equation here, W of X equals T. And um, right, let's fix some notation. I will, I will skip through these calculations a little bit quicker because I have a restricted uh, amount of time, but you can, you can differentiate this um, characterizing equation uh, in space twice, and then you will get the relation um, for the Hessian of W. And if you differentiate it in time, you get this level set flow equation. So this is the characterizing equation of mean curvature flow in terms of level set formulation. So one equals minus the mean curvature times the gradient of W applied to the normal. Um, Okay, we want, in the end, we want to extract information on the full Hessian of W. So not only in tangential directions like here, but on also in normal directions. And hence we have to differentiate um, this uh, thing again. Let me just first mention that the normal of the level set or of the flow hypersurface is just given by the gradient, right? So if we have a level set, then the gradient of this function is perpendicular to this level set. So the gradient must be a multiple of the normal and you can calculate the factor H. Um, out of may this in this in this equation here. Okay, so now let's differentiate this characterizing equation uh, again twice in time. Let me just give me some formulas for that. It's not very interesting. It's easy, easy, straightforward chain rule application. So important is that the Hessian acts on the normal um, in this way. So it, it spits out the the time derivative of the mean curvature. 
And um, if you collect everything which we have calculated in the Hessian, you can see that, that D2 of W is equal to this matrix here, where the upper left entry is for the normal directions, the lower right entry is for the tangential directions, and here's the mixed part. So this is the Hessian. And interestingly enough, this very looks like it contains all the ingredients of the Hanak inequality. Um, and I will show you the connection on the next slide. All right, so um, we now suppose that, that the particular function, namely the square root of two times w is concave. Um, you will see in a second why we do this. So if this is concave, we can just calculate the Hessian of u in terms of the Hessian of w by the chain rule. And um, hence we have like u times the Hessian of u equals this matrix where we only have one additional term compared to what we saw on the earlier slide, right? Because we have this um, like mixed derivative term which comes from differentiating the, the square root twice. But note that dw is in normal direction, so it only gives you an entry in the upper left hand side here on this matrix. So it really adds up, or adds into this term h over u squared. And um, Right, u is non-negative, so if we now assume that, the, that, that u is concave, then this left-hand side is non-negative. Um, non Meaning that uh, after putting some notation, right, we now, we now put the, the, the concavity in here, which shows that minus of the Hessian is uh, non-negative, and then we just plug everything in um, with respect to this nice test vector here um, in order to really um, cancel uh, to, to give you what, what is this mixed term which you have seen earlier, like this bij um, thing, right? Um, if you plug this in, you will get zero is less or equal than dth plus h over 2w minus this um, gradient term of h. And this is really just an invariant notation of what you have seen uh, here, right? This is really exactly the same equation if you I put coordinates here because it's easier to see what happens, but it is really the same thing. So from the assumption that u is concave, we can extract the differential Hanak inequality as originally proven by Hamilton. And uh, this is, in my opinion, a beautiful approach to this thing because the question now reduces, uh, it abstracts from the curvature flow um, and gives you a question about elliptic equations, right? Note that, um, where is it here? This is an elliptic equation. So the, the second derivative is hidden in H. Um, it, is not, it is not strictly elliptic. There are degenerate directions, um, but it is an elliptic equation. So we can now think about elliptic equations instead when we, different, when we want to deduce a Hanak inequality. And this is where this whole thing comes from, where this whole project comes from. So um, we were trying to see if this can be employed, this method can be employed in other ambient spaces. Um, because we all knew that it was very difficult in other ambient spaces to, to calculate um, this inequality by hand. Um, and, and hence we tried to, to use this method in the other ambient spaces. So um, yeah, we wanted to go to non-Euclidean backgrounds. And namely in particular, we wanted to, re to relax the restrictive assumptions on the speed function um, that we had in earlier works on this Hanak inequality. You recall, um, going back here, um, if you leave the ambient space, uh, if you leave the Euclidean ambient space, you have to put additional assumptions on your function f. For example, the convexity, which is not needed here. And if the, mo if the ambient space becomes even more complicated, we can only treat the mean curvature. Right, this was this was a very big drawback here. So you really have to exchange properties of f um, to properties of the ambient space if you if you want to get results. So we were trying to see if this new method by by the level set approach can lead to better or more broader range of Hanak inequalities in these other ambient spaces. So, um, right, this was the plan. Unfortunately, we miserably failed, and um, I hope that in the next and uh, second half of my talk, you will, you will get an impression of why this is difficult. Um, of course, though we failed, the story is not over, otherwise I, was, otherwise I would not be here. 
So we, we now get away from the curvature flows and focus on elliptic equations um, just to see what we can do and how we can prove concavity of elliptic equations. So this is now the second part of my talk, which is about two-point maximum principles and concavity of solutions. And this is an old, so in the Euclidean space, what, what I show you now is an, is an old method due to Korova, Kennington, Kabul, and several other people um, who were working on concavity of solutions. And I will illustrate the method in the Euclidean case for simplicity. So let's say we have a convex domain in Rn, omega. Um, right, so we know that if, if our function is continuous, we can, we can characterize the concavity or we can define the concavity of a function u by demanding this function capital Z to be non-negative, right? For every parameter t and for every pair of points x and y, this is precisely um, what gives you concavity if this guy is non-negative. So the idea is now, if you want to prove that this guy is non-negative, just investigate what happens at negative minimal points. And this is a re really maximum principle. So it's basically a derivative test, right? So if we have a function u, then the idea is just to, to look at a negative minimum of this function z and see um, what we can do and how we can exclude negative minima um, of this guy. So for the sake of simplicity at, at the moment, let me just focus on what happens um, when we have interior minimal points. So we, we, we suppose that we have negative minimal point of this function z and we, we also suppose that x and y are in the interior of the domain. Um, so that I can illustrate the method. Um, t is automatically in the interior because when t is zero or one, this guy is zero. Okay, so let's calculate something. Um, we have zero gradients because we are at a minimum of the function z. So that means we can differentiate um, at the midpoint, uh, which I call, uh, it's not the midpoint, it's like the convex combination point, but in following, I'll probably keep calling that midpoint. That is a, a little z. And um, we have in both variables, x and y, we have zero derivative of z. And um, right, if we just plug that, if we calculate that, we can see that, that we have this chain of equalities. And this in particular gives you that at all the three points, the two endpoints and the midpoint, we have equality of the gradients, which is good, which will help a lot later. Um, so this is the first order condition. The second order condition is the following. So we know at the negative minimal point, the Hessian of Z is um, non-negative. And now we can just apply a particular um, pair of vectors uh, plugging it into z. So this, this differential operator applied to z is also non-negative. And if we calculate that straightforward from, from this line here, you can just, you can just extract this, this final um, equality here. And um, you will see that some of these things cancel. So if you have, if you focus on the midpoint terms, which are here, here, and here, you can see that only uij of z is remaining. So you, you arrive at, at this um, nice um, concavity type looking inequality. Um, right, so this, this looks like a concavity on the level of second derivatives. And note that we have not used any partial differential equation yet. So this is really just what we have done is we have extracted a second order condition at minimal points of this concavity function here. So there is no information involved yet. Um, except that we are at interior points of the domain. So, um, but now we can try to use that when we are given a PDE. So let's suppose we have like a pretty general um, fully nonlinear equation with the differential operator F acting on the gradient and the Hessian and some nonlinear term on the right, depending up to first order. Um, so now we want to extract conditions on F and B, which allow us to employ this inequality nicely to get information of the function U itself at the minimal point, right? Recall that we want to show this concavity property. 
Um, and now we can try to transfer this second order condition to a zero order condition. And um, right, so now we use the PDE for that. Uh, and, and just start calculating and see what kind of conditions we need. So let's write it down again. So here's the PDE, B is equal to F and we evaluate this at the midpoint. Then since we have this second order um, concavity property, we can make this estimate, estimating from above by the convex combination, only if this F is weakly elliptic, meaning that it is uh, weakly monotone in the, second in the second argument. So there is no, no strict ellipticity needed here. It's just the weak monotonicity which we need in order to make this estimate. Um, okay, and the aim is now to pull this apart to, to get information at the endpoints, separate information at the endpoints X and Y. And we can pull this apart if we have convexity in the second variable. So now we suppose that, that F independence of the second variable is convex, then we can simply make this next estimate by, by convexity, right? Um, also note that I have already switched from Z to X and from z to y here because recall the gradients were all the same at these three points which is very important at this point so we can just flip around the gradients as we like and this is the crucial one crucial aspect in this calculation okay how do we go on um we are back to the pde right so we can we can uh, now use the pde again here and here to return to b and now we want to go backwards. So we want to, to put things together again. Um, and we suppose for that, that B is concave in the first two variables, right? In the variables Z and U, it is concave. And then we can estimate it like this. So then we have B of Z, the convex combination of the, of the values of U and the gradient. But now we can nicely compare these things, right? At the, at the, at the top, we have, we have B of Z, uh, u and du all evaluated at z and at the bottom we have b evaluated at z at the convex combination and the gradient at z so we can make a statement about how u and the convex combination of the values of u compare right namely if if b is assumed to be strictly decreasing in the second variable we um we obtain a contradiction right because uh, if, if it is not concave. If u is not concave, we obtain a, con, a, a, con, a contradiction in case that b is strictly decreasing, right? So if we assume that we have the, that z is non-negative and this proves the concavity of u. So this is a nice one-page calculation how to, how to employ this concavity maximum principle to get concavity of solutions um, to pretty general elliptic equations. Right, this is for the Euclidean space. And now we were trying to adapt this method to the sphere um, because we were, this was like the model case, um, which is not Euclidean. We were trying to get the Hanak inequality in the sphere. Uh, so we were looking at these kind of equations on the sphere. And um, right, I forgot to tell you something about the boundary condition. Of course, I should mention that. We assume that the points are in the interior so basically we just assume that we have the concavity already on the boundary, meaning that um, at boundary points, the graph of the function u lies below its tangent planes. So this is really the natural boundary condition to consider. So formally you would just write down this inequality at, at boundary points, um, x naught, you would have to have that the, the plane which is tangent to the graph is above um, the graph itself. Uh, so this is the boundary condition. And if you have, if you, if you impose this condition, you can easily calculate that um, by, an in, by an invert variation of your concavity function, you could even decrease further the value of Z. So that means that uh, minima cannot be attained at the boundary. Uh, minima must be attained at the, at the interior. So this is how we formally justify that we can look at interior points. Okay, so far so good. Let's uh, look at this thing in the sphere. Um, it is, the result is super similarly looking 
um, because, well, we tried to just copy the calculation um, from the Euclidean case, but we have to make some adjustments. Um, and the reason is um, basically due to the more complicated geom geometry of the, of the spherical space. And you will see that like when I talk about the proof of this result. Um, let me explain what we did. So we, we have again the convex domain, which is now assumed to be geodesically convex, which means that um, for two points in omega bar, um, all minimizing geodesics, or there is a unit minimizing geodesic which lies in omega bar. So it's really, so the whole thing must be contained actually in a hemisphere, right? Because they, are, they cannot be antipodal points. Um, so it, will, it is a convex domain with no antipodal points and the convexity is as you expect, right? You take geodesics and they must be contained in omega bar. So this is like what people call strong convexity of domains in the sphere. There are many other notions of convexity in the sphere, but we require the strongest um, in, this, in this result. And then again, we have the same situation, differentiable function, which satisfies a PDE. And you already see here that we need to make some adjustments. Um, we have put the gradient in absolute values um, because it is not the case anymore that the gradients at the midpoints and the endpoints are the same. You will see that on the next slide. So this is some drawback, some technical drawback we have to make. Anyway, all the other assumptions look pretty much the same. So F is increasing in both variables. So um, what is, what is, what is uh, additional in comparison to what we assumed in the Euclidean case is that F must also be increasing with respect to this first variable. We haven't assumed this in the Euclidean case. Um, but the other assumptions are the same. It's convex in the second variable and the weekly increasing in the second variable too. Um, similarly for the function B, in addition to what we have assumed in the previous calculation, we just assume some monotonicity with respect to this final variable here. Um, besides that, everything is the same. The boundary condition looks similar. Um, it's designed such that interior points, uh, interior minima are attained. Um, and then the conclusion is used concave. So the, the program to prove this is precisely what we did, but we have to to overcome some technical difficulties, which I will explain. So how would you do it? Um, of course, you would write down a convex combination um, and a so-called concavity function, capital Z. Um, what you have to adjust though, of course, is the argument of the function u at the midpoint, right? Because the, the midpoint is not a linear convex combination anymore. It is, it has to be evaluated along the geodesic. Um, the geodesic is denoted by gamma x, y. Um, and this is the unique minimizing geodesic from x to y. This final um, term is the same. We can just interpolate between the values. And it is also known um, and a classical result from spherical or Riemannian convexity, if you want, that this function is non-negative precisely when the function u is concave. Um, whatever notion of concavity you would like to use. For example, the Hessian is non-negative, you can, you can use. So it is, it is known that this is non-negative if and only if the Hessian of u is non-negative. Uh, so we can basically do the same calculation. We assume we have um, an interior minimum, which is negative, and then try to get a contradiction. So, uh, right. Um, now we have to calculate the first derivative. At, for example, in direction x, again, um, of course it is zero because it's a minimum. But now you have to differentiate this guy with respect to x. And what you see here is how do you, how do you differentiate geodesic with respect to endpoint variation? And what this does, it gives you a Jacobi field along the geodesic, uh, which is a vector field. Um, well, it, it, is a, it is a vector field along a curve. So at every point of the curve, you have a vector of the sphere. And um, really what this is, the derivative of geodesic with respect to one endpoint is a Jacobi field, which I denote by Jx. And this is applied to the gradient. 
at the point Z, right? Because we evaluate that at a minimal point. So the du is evaluated at Z. And differentiating this here with respect to X is of course super easy, right? There's only T du X from this guy. So what we get is um, not that the gradients are equal, but we get that the gradient at the midpoint applied to this Jacobi field is equal to T times the gradient at the end point. And something similar we get at the other end point. In particular, we see that the gradients do not coincide anymore. And hence, we cannot just replace the gradient in this calculation, which is the final aim of this whole thing. We cannot just replace the, the gradient at Z by the gradient of X. But instead, what we did, we assumed a monotonicity and chose the monotonicity to, to work exactly in the correct direction. So this is really a, a theorem where the assumptions come after the proof. Um, okay, so, right. The crucial part is that in the sphere, we could still get this monotonicity relation. We could show that due to the positive curvature of the sphere or the non-negative curvature would be enough that, that the gradient, the norm of the gradient satisfies this relation. So the gradients at the end point are actually the same, um, but the gradient at the midpoint has smaller norm than the gradients at the end point. So this is the crucial part why the such a monotonicity relation works. If we hadn't this, for example, in hyperbolic space where it definitely fails, you would have to get rid of the dependence of the gradient whatsoever so that the result would look um, less general because then you would just get rid of the dependence of, of the gradient. Um, right, so but in this field, we could still manage to, to do this monotonicity thing. Okay, so far, so bad. Uh, it gets worse because we have to calculate second derivatives. Um, and the second derivative is given by, let me go back here, we differentiate this guy um, again, where we get a second derivative of u at the midpoint applied to another Jacobi field, but now comes the bad part. We have to differentiate this Jacobi field with respect to y or to x or whatever second derivative we take. And here comes the mess. So this may really made up a lot um, of, of problems. Uh, so because this guy, which I just mentioned, is denoted by, by k, um, and it is the covariant derivative of the Jacobi field j x i in the in direction um, x j. So it is a derivative of a vector field along the curve. And okay, the second term is again no problem, but the third term here. So this is the second derivative of z. And now you do all combinations. You also do this with respect to y j. So you get all kind of mixed case here. And really we had no idea what to do with this guy for a long time. Um, because you, it, it doesn't seem that there is a way to get a sign on it, right? Because we have no idea how, how this vector aligns with the gradient of the function u. Are they, are they um, parallel? Are they perpendicular? We have no idea. Though until today, we have no idea. But we could do something else, which I will show you. Um, so the only way to extract properties for k is by differentiating the Jacobi equation, right? because know that, that the Jacobi field satisfies this well-known Jacobi equation. And from differentiating this thing, you can extract information or you can extract, extract in equation for the function K. Um, and um, <clears throat> right, I already explained that what's written here. Um, the, in the Euclidean space, this is not there because J is linear. So in Euclidean space, all Jacobi fields are linear. So this, this term isn't even there, sorry. Um, but here we, we have no sign. But, but what we could do from the equation you get from this, from this guy is the following lemma. Um, this is like the key lemma for the, whole, for the whole result. So at the midpoint of the geodesic, we could calculate that this particular combination of case is zero, um, where you can put either plus and plus here or minus and minus here. So this is like, these are like two equations. Um, and somehow this comes from, from the symmetry of the spherical Jacobi field. So you, I don't do the calculation, it's nasty, but um, what you can see is Jacobi fields in the sphere 
are basically given by sine and cosine functions. Um, and at precisely at the midpoint, things match up so nicely that this particular combination is zero. So also recall, wh why should we just bother about such a combination? Um, recall the Euclidean calculation. What we did in the Euclidean calculation was that we didn't just use the full Hessian of Z, we just used a particular combination of second derivatives of Z. And um, so this is exactly what we want to do in the sphere too. And for that, actually, the, the, this particular combination of K's actually suffices. Right? We, we just want to look at this com combination. And in order to do that, all we need is that, right? So this, this really um, is the key. But the bad, bad aspect here, we only have it at the midpoint. And there we have to think some more. Why is it enough to work at the midpoint? Um, because you can uh, recall uh, like 100 year or more than 100 year old result due to Jensen that concavity is equivalent to midpoint concavity, at least if your function is nice enough and continuous would be super sufficient here. Right? So the, this is, uh, I found that in the paper of Jensen from 1903, and it really says concavity is equivalent to midpoint concavity. So you can really restrict to, when you want to prove concavity, you can restrict to this two point function here, uh, z of x and y equals just the, the previous concavity function evaluated at t equals one half. And um, <clears throat> when you do now your calculation with the second derivatives, you, now you can copy really literally the, the calculation from the Euclidean space. Because when you look at this particular combination of partial derivatives of z, then the, the k term, which appears uh, here, just drops out. Because this is just adding up four of such equations. And then you arrive at this, at this combination of k's, which drops out to zero. And um, you really can just literally copy the, the calculation from the Euclidean space here. Um, after, of course, impo imposing all the assumptions here, you can, you can do the chain of inequalities as in Euclidean space. And um, that gives you an idea. I hope that gives you an idea of the proof. Uh, please, please ask if, if you have further questions, of course. Um, but so far, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>